Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, I'm going to be continuing my series on the cheapest electronics available on the internet. Today's item is an ATX power supply from AliExpress. I have here the information sheet on it. It costs me only $22, and I don't actually know what the power rating is on it. So here, it claims to be a 200 watt rated power supply, and then it says it's for normal economic use, which is kind of interesting because normally you would expect uh, sellers from China to say something like for Bitcoin miner or for gaming rig, but no, they're pretty straightforward about it not being a super high powered unit. Now the other thing is it says 200 watts there, but then it also says 150 to 200 watts here, another 200 watts here, and then on the back page here, it actually says 400 watts in one location. So this, th this power supply could theoretically be rated for anything from 150 watts up through 400 watts, or potentially even less, depending on what they're really trying to sell. It's kind of hard to say. But in any case, it is a power supply. It does meet the ATX form factor. It's a bit lightweight. It's probably not as heavy as some of the other power supplies I've used before, and uh, the sheet metal that it's made out of is certainly not the thickest. But I am curious to see, A, will it actually run? And B, how much power will I be able to get out of it reliably before voltage sag occurs or before catastrophic failure occurs? Having a look at the outside label of the power supply, you can see that it has markings for fairly surprisingly high wattages, 500, 600, 700, and 800, none of which are marked. I am thinking that underneath this sticker, which is actually the removable that has these Chinese symbols on it, uh, I actually looked up the translation of these, and these actually say good up to, so like good up to some amount of wattage, it looks like it might be sitting on the 400 watt stamp. So if this is the correct, it could theoretically be a 400 watt power supply, but it's hard to say. Now you can't just add up all of the powers on the output rails, because typically the maximum rating of the entire power supply will be somewhat lower than the sum of all these parts. These are just the individual maximum rail currents. But based on these and comparing this to other power supplies that I've used in the past, this would be approximately, probably on the order of a maybe 300 to 400 watt power supply if these are accurate. So there it is, that's uh, what the ratings are. We can have a look at the peripherals. The uh, wiring is probably a little bit lightweight on the gauge, particularly some of these, uh, like this CPU power connector is uh, pretty, this looks like maybe 20 gauge wire. Let's see if it says on it. Uh, it says 20 gauge, yeah, so all of these are 20 gauge. Typically you'll see 18 or even 16 gauge wire on the better power supplies. So we'll have to see if there's excessive voltage drop across that. So we've got the motherboard ATX connector. This is going to be power for the main board, and that's where we're going to, that contains all the different uh, rails plus, say, the power input uh, and the uh, power OK lines. Here's our CPU 4-pin power connector. That delivers 12 volts to the motherboard for the VRMs on the main board. And we also have an additional uh, peripheral connector. It's got two Molex connectors, and it's got two SATA connectors. Important to note, though, there is no graphics card connector on this. So if I decide I want to use this with a more powerful graphics card that requires external power, I'll have to get an adapter to connect one of the Molex connectors to the GPU. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to set this up uh, with a power supply with a 240 volt transformer and uh, hook it up to a, a computer motherboard and see if we can get it to post. Now it is a 240 volt only power supply. It does not have a selector switch to opt for the 120 option. And I was actually told this by the seller. When I purchased this, I was actually notified in advance uh, and asked whether I had a 240 volt service. So really pretty good service. I, I give them props for making sure that I was gonna have the power that I needed to run this. So not bad on the AliExpress seller's part. So here's a quick look at the power setup that I'm going to have set up. I have power coming in, supplying a kilowatt meter, which allows me to check the wattage being drawn by the loads. And then I have that connected to a step-up transformer, which is supplying me with 240 volts that I can use to run the power supply, since it does require 240 volts. 
So here's the machine I'm going to be using to test this ATX power supply. This is an older uh, dual core Intel machine. Its CPU has a TDP of around 75 watts. It's got a kind of workstation grade graphics card in it. No PCIe uh, power connectors for it, but it is, uh, this is a GT630. It's a GeForce GT630. So that'll pull up another 50 or so watts. Uh, so overall, this, this system I've tested to be about a 200 watt total system between the hard drives and the motherboard fans, graphics card, when it's under full load, uh, full synthetic load with Prime95 and Furmark. So that's going to be the configuration I'm using. Uh, I'm using a smaller machine not only because I don't want to immediately overload the power supply, but also I'm using older equipment so that if the power supply shorts out or, or generates erratic voltages, it's not going to blow any expensive equipment. I wouldn't certainly test my high-end gaming rig with GTX 960 and quad-core CPU with this uh, power supply, at least not when it's been uh, totally untested as of yet. So before I begin this test, I'm actually going to hook up a uh, well-known power supply. This is a Cooler Master 500 watt, kind of middle of the range, 60, so, 60 or so dollar power supply to this machine and do some tests of voltage and hook the scope up and measure the ripple. Basically get some baseline tests for the type of behavior that I expect a machine of this size to, uh, to exhibit when it's being powered by a well-known power supply. Now it won't exactly be a perfectly fair comparison because this is a 500 watt power supply and the other power supply is probably a 300 watt so this one will be somewhat less heavily taxed by the system than the other power supply will. But at the same time I think it's reasonable just to get some baseline readings for the overall behavior of the power system. Alright so I have the PC connected to the 500 watt Cooler Master power supply which I know works. Now right now I have it just running basically at idle and it's using about 89 watts which is pretty much to be expected for a machine of this age with physical hard drives. It's not the most efficient uh, at idle. So I'm going to start Prime95 and what that's going to do is it's going to run the CPU at full, uh, full load basically and that's going to effectively maximize power dissipation on the CPU. And then after we've uh, taken a look at the power consumption I'm going to turn on Furmark which is going to then run the GPU at its full capacity. So here we go, I'm going to start Prime95. I'll do in-place FFTs for maximum power consumption. So that's going to start, and you can see the CPU is now at 100% capacity. As you can see on the watt meter, we're drawing about 153 watts from the, uh, from the wall. Now the machine probably draws a little less than that because it's uh, not accounting for the inefficiencies in the power supply and in the step-up transformer. I am running this one also at 240 volts, but just as a baseline estimate, we'll say it's using about 153 watts. So now I'm going to go to Furmark, and I'm going to set up 1024 by 768 GPU stress test. So now Furmark is running, and you can see it's basically just doing this arbitrary render of like a, a texture pattern with several different layers of 3D rendering on top of it. But the important thing to make note of is the power consumption. We're now dissipating 205 watts. So this system is basically running at its full power consumption capacity. Both the CPU and GPU are running at full load. Now, it's not super, super critical to keep track of, but just out of curiosity, we're going to also just look at how the average frames per second is about 8 or 9. Uh, that's fairly normal for a graphics card of this level. This is not a gaming card. This is just a uh, This is just a workstation card But it'll be interesting to see when we switch power supplies if there's any significant change in the fr uh, frame rate Not that that necessarily will be directly due to the power supply, but it's just something else to observe So you can see 207 watts is our basic uh, like baseline power level when the system is under full load with a known good power supply so the next thing I'm going to do is get the oscilloscope and the voltmeter and we can determine if the power supply is experiencing any significant voltage drop or ripple. So measuring on a voltmeter from the, one of the Molex connectors on the ATX power supply, you can see we're getting about 12.1 volts, which is totally within the tolerable parameters of the power supply. Granted this is the good power supply, so that's just a baseline reading for what we should be expecting from a properly functioning system. So I've connected the oscilloscope now, 
And as you can see, this is zoomed in very far to 20 millivolts per division, and we're getting approximately 12 millivolts of RMS uh, ripple on the line. We're seeing a peak max of 56 millivolts and a peak min of 43 millivolts. So basically, we're seeing around plus or minus 60 millivolts under full load with the good known uh, 500 watt power supply. So those are just some numbers that we can then compare against our experimental AliExpress power supply to see how they stack up. I'll install that other power supply now, and then we'll see if it, A, if it actually posts, and then if it does boot up, we'll see how it performs at full load, and we'll take these same measurements and see if, how they stack up. All right, so I've connected the AliExpress power supply to the system, and one of the things that I noticed that's rather interesting is the SATA connectors for the hard drive and uh, CD-ROM, the SATA power connectors, are really hard to, to, to squeeze on on this thing. It's almost like the tolerances were not correct from the factory. So I suppose we'll see if that's going to be a sign of things to come with things being not quite up to spec or not quite optimal. So I'm going to turn the power on and I'm going to see if this thing posts and uh, then we'll do some more measurements. All right, just had to correct some loose connections to the motherboard connection. Now it's all good to go, so we're going to press the power button. And the fans have come on and the system is now running. So let's find out if it posts. It's drawing 126 watts. Yep, we've got an image on the screen. Typically this machine takes a fairly long time to boot since it is a dual core with a physical hard drive. I'll get Prime95 loaded up, and then we'll see if uh, we can actually put this under some proper load. So before we start Prime95 in Furmark, and while we're at about 80 watts, I wanted to show you what the open circuit voltages are. So you can see we're getting 12.26 to 12.3 volts when on the 12 volt rail, which is a little bit high, but not absurdly high, nothing that's probably going to be destructive. And we'll take a look at also the 5 volt rail and see how that looks. So I've moved it over to the 5 volt rail, and we're getting about 5.15 volts, which is also within some uh, pretty good tolerance. I don't have direct access to the 3.3 volt rail from the Molex connectors, so I'm going to assume that that's also somewhat well regulated. So the 12 volt rail is really the one I'm going to be keeping an eye on as sort of the benchmark for how well this power supply is doing in terms of voltage regulation. And uh, I'm going to get these uh, tests started, and will determine how it performs when it's actually running under some significant load. So I'm going to start Prime95. We've got our CPU at 100%. Now, if uh, the power supply starts to really struggle, it may also result in the machine crashing or becoming unstable. So that's also something we'll want to keep an eye out for. So just with that running, we're pulling 151 watts and we're still at 12.24 volts, so we're still pretty well within our original voltage regulation, which is a good sign. So let's see if we can get the GPU involved. We'll get G uh, Furmark started up on the GPU. It's going to initialize Furmark. All right, Furmark is now running smoothly, and we are getting 9 frames per second, just as before. We're still at 100% CPU usage, 100 or 99% GPU usage. Interestingly enough, we're using 222 watts down here, so we're actually pulling a little bit more power at the wall, which I guess is probably due to this being a somewhat less efficient power supply. And let's have a look at our line voltage. Looks like we're getting 12.11 volts on the 12 volt rail, so it has sagged a little bit. And this is not due to uh, resistance in the wiring, because I'm measuring this from one of the Molex connectors, which is independent from the motherboard uh, connectors which are actually carrying the power. So that means the power supply's output regulation has actually gone down a little bit, meaning we're probably approaching the limit of this power supply's total capacity. That being said though, 12.1 volts is certainly well within tolerance. Pretty much anything above 11.7 I would consider to be totally satisfactory. And our graphics card is pretty much doing exactly the same. We're not seeing any significant drops in frame rate or in performance, and the system is not crashed. Now, later today, I'm going to be running this through a burn-in test where I probably let it do this, uh, do this run for maybe an hour or two and see if it remains stable under the long-term operation. 
But uh, as it is for the moment, the program is running well. The computer, the, with the hardware that's in it at least, this is not a super beefy computer, is running suitably on this power supply. I almost forgot to get the scope back out and test the ripple, and I'm glad I didn't forget because there's some pretty interesting stuff going on here. So I've had to turn the time base, or the uh, voltage scale, way up to 100 millivolts per division. So we're getting about double the ripple out of this power supply that we were from the other power supply. Now obviously that doesn't seem to be enough to be causing problems for the computer. It still is operating satisfactorily, I haven't seen a crash. But it is important to note that excessive amounts of ripple on the line could cause problems for computer equipment. You could get errors, you could get uh, system damage, and uh, potentially you could have crashing and, and other stability problems. That being said, I wouldn't say 24 millivolts of RMS ripple is a huge deal, but it is definitely uh, not as good as the name brand power supply. So that's an area that we can just keep an eye on as things go along. All right, so it's been a little over an hour since I started this, and it's still totally stable. The power supply is actually not getting particularly warm at all. The air coming out is basically cool. Um, the system is still drawing 230 watts, and the voltage has gone down ever so slightly, but it's still around 12.08 uh, volts, which is totally within tolerance. So uh, that's a pretty uh, positive, impressive result. I'm beginning to wonder, just because of how little heat is coming out of this thing, if maybe it really is a 400 watt power supply. I mean, it's not really, it's doing a fair bit of work, but it's not really heating up too much at all. And I certainly haven't seen any issues with stability. So now that we've established that it works well with computers and computer equipment, the next step is going to be to test this same power supply on a little bit higher demand load that's specific to the 12 volt rail. I'd like to hook a power inverter up to it and see if I can run some, uh, run a dynamic load and see if I can actually uh, start seeing more voltage drop at the higher currents. So I'll get a, a test bench set up for that and we can do some further investigation. All right, so here's my experimental setup for load testing. What I basically did was I took the CPU power connector and cut that off of the uh, output from the power supply and I've connected the positive 12 volt and the ground rails to this Centec inverter. This is a 400 watt inverter. Now I've got my DC clamp meter connected to it so I can measure the amount of current going from the 12 volt rail to the inverter. And then I have two loads connected to the inverter. Off screen I have a 100 watt light bulb which is kind of going to be my base load which I have switched off right now. And then I also have this uh, DC power supply. And the DC power supply I have connected to a bank of power resistors. The idea here is when I turn on the light bulb, I'll automatically load it up to whatever the uh, little over 100 watts that will be drawn from the base load is, and then I'll be able to linearly increase the uh, voltage across the resistors, and as a result, directly influence the amount of power delivered from the system. Now this power supply is rated nominally to 17 amps at 12 volts, which we're gonna test and see how it performs at that level. However, uh, that really won't be an ultimately perfect test because it is also rated to 40 amps at the 5 volt rail and unfortunately I really just don't have the equipment to properly test the 5 volt rail to such a high level. So I won't really be testing this to its absolute full capacity, but I am curious to see if it will uh, deliver the full 17 amps at 12 volts and if so, if I can actually nudge it a little bit above that since there wouldn't be any other load on the 5 volt rail. I'd, if I can get like 20 amps at 12 volts out of it, then uh, this could actually be a very good candidate power supply for a UPS project that I'm going to be working on in the future. So I also have the voltmeter connected, and for some reason the voltage regulation has gone down a little bit. I'm not really sure what variable has changed in that. It, um, it could just be because the, there's no significant load on it, or it also could be because there's no load on the 5 volt rail, and uh, having a load on the 5 volt rail for some power supplies is required for stable voltage regulation. It's just a quirk of the way the power supplies are designed, and I'm not really sure how much that will affect this test, but uh, if it does become an issue and it doesn't behave like it should, I'll get another power resistor and hook that up to the 5. For now though, since we are getting a satisfactory reasonable 11.7 volts out of it, I'm just going to proceed with testing and we'll see how it goes from there. So I've got the inverter connected. I'm going to uh, apply the base load, the 100 watts. 
So that has dropped the voltage a little bit, and we're drawing 11.2 amps from the power supply. Now I should note that I am measuring the voltage from a separate Molex connector that's unrelated to the, uh, to the wires connecting to the power or to the inverter, which means the voltage drop across these wires is not going to directly affect this. This is the voltage directly off of the board inside the power supply. Now one other thing I wanted to note is the ins these wires are actually not only 20 gauge, but these are actually copper clad aluminum. So they're a little bit lightweight for the task at hand and they already are a little bit warm. Uh, for this test though, I'm not as concerned about voltage drop and if the wires start to get too hot, if they start to smell, I'll back off the voltage and find a different configuration. So let's uh, start pulling up on this supply here and keep a good eye on this voltage display here, or this current display rather. Let's see if I can get that so it looks good. We're at 11.24 amps there and I'm going to start raising the load. So we're at 11.8, 12, 13 amps, 16 amps. All right, we're at 17.5. I'm going to back it off just a little. All right, right now we're at 17.11 amps. Let's see how hot that cable's getting. It's getting pretty hot. But we are drawn and we're definitely putting power into these resistors. I'm going to go see how the air coming out of the fan from the power supply feels. A little bit warm, starting to warm up. Let's see if it's making any buzzing sound from the inverter load. Yeah, a little bit. It's kind of buzzing a little bit, but that's to be expected since this inverter is drawing a uh, 60 hertz pulse load. Inverters are actually one of the most difficult loads to drive for most power supplies because they basically are a bunch of sudden spikes in load to drive their uh, switch transformers and then subsequently to switch the output at 60 hertz. So they can be somewhat heavy loads. 11.09 volts is reasonable. It's a little low. I think if this was a computer application, I'd be unhappy about such a low voltage. But uh, this is not a computer application. This is, a, uh, this is a, an external power supply application, which 11.08 volts is pretty reasonable for. Eventually, I will be taking the power supply apart to see how modifiable it is. I'd like to do a couple of things to it. Primarily, I'd like to see if I can adjust the output voltage, maybe pull it up to like 13.5 so I could maybe use it to float charge lead acid batteries. And I'd also like to see if I can uh, get rid of the watchdog circuit so that it's more tolerant to inrush, like the inverter inrush. Uh, to get this inverter to power, I actually had to basically like take my on-off uh, green wire connector and click it a few times to get the watchdog to not trip the overload because of the large inrush from the inverter. So it's been running for a little while and seems to be doing satisfactory at 16.9 amps. I think I might pull it up a little more, see if the voltage gets anywhere below 10, like 10.5, and also just see if it'll eventually trip on overcurrent or overheat. Uh, if I can get it to 20 amps continuously, I'd be very happy with that. And I don't really want to totally destroy it, but at the same time, it could also make for an interesting uh, disassembly video regardless. So. I'm not that afraid of uh, overloading it. So let's uh, pull up a little more on the power load. So I'll go to 11 volts, 17.3 amps, 18 amps, 18.5. Now the voltage is coming down, 19. 21 amps. We're at 10.87 volts at 21 amps. Now the inverter has also shown up its red light, which means it is getting too little voltage and it's about to shut off. So we're getting 10.8 from the board, which means after these wires, we're probably getting about 10.5 to the inverter. And this inverter will run down to about 10.3 and then it'll shut off. So it's, it's right on its uh, minimum voltage right now. We're holding pretty steady at 10.85, thereabout at 21 amps. Let's see what the heat feels like here. 
a little bit warm. The air coming out is definitely hotter than before, that's for sure. And these copper clad aluminum wires are getting, insulation is starting to get a little sticky, so I might have to back it off pretty soon. I mean, that's not really a big concern because if I was actually going to use this as a UPS power supply, I would bundle up all the yellows and all the blacks together rather than just having two. Honestly, it's, it's not doing half bad for being run all the way up to 21 amps. That's, that's over two, well over 200 watts, so that's pretty darn good. I, uh, I'll let this run for a little bit longer and then I think I will uh, move on to some subsequent tests and probably a disassembly as well. So I've been in a few minutes running at the 21 amp load and uh, the voltage has come down just a little bit, but it's doing okay, so I think I'm going to shut this down now. The 21 amp load is a little over what I would be running at my maximum UPS load, which would be about 20 amps. So I think if uh, provided nothing else, comes up as being a problem, I would say this thing could do 20 amps probably continuously. I did look inside and some of the heat sinks look a little bit undersized, so I think there's definitely going to be room for modification and upgrades to this power supply, but uh, on the whole I'm pretty satisfied with its, its load performance. I'm not a huge fan of this voltage regulation, but we are technically over spec, so that's not a huge concern of mine. One thing I am curious about is I'd like to see what the 5 volt rail looks like when the rest of it is already under this much load at the 12 volt. So I'm going to go ahead and look at that right now. And that's kind of interesting. It's actually gone up. So the 5 volt rail is up to around 5.4, which I would consider almost to be out of spec. And that's kind of an interesting observation. I'm guessing there's some line side regulation going on on the 5 volt side. Or, or on the, um, rather on the higher voltage side that could be resulting in the entire, uh, entire set of rails being skewed up just to compensate for the low 12 volt rail because the 12 volt is the one under load. It's pretty interesting and uh, just interesting to see the type of response behavior that this power supply exhibits. So I was just shutting everything down and I noticed that uh, after running at the 21 amp load for a, a while, the exhaust gas from this power supply was actually developing a rather strong odor, kind of a molten plastic smell. So I suspect that 20 amps may be a bit aggressive for this system. Like I said, I'd like to investigate whether some of the heat sinking could be upgraded inside of it. And I think when, uh, when we take it apart, it'll be interesting to investigate what is actually, uh, if anything looks like it's been damaged after that test run. I suspect it's more to do with just the wiring itself getting quite hot because I'm only using two conductors to carry the full 20 amps, but at the same time there's probably a couple of chokes and uh, maybe some other uh, electronic components inside that were being uh, exceeded in their ratings. The, to my knowledge there's nothing wrong with the power supply currently, it was not damaged by the overload, but it'll be interesting to see if maybe there is some visual indication of what was heating up. All right, I think it's teardown time. So I'm gonna see if we can uh, dismantle this and see how they managed to build a pretty decent so far power supply for 22 bucks free shipping. So I'm gonna go in and uh, I think just start taking these screws out here. Looks like uh, I'm looking to see if there's any better way to get in, but that looks like the way that it's gonna be done. So I'll get after it here. I'm going to break their quality assurance warranty void sticker, which is certainly a fine thing to do because I don't plan on sending this back to the factory. And we are in. So that is what we've got inside of here. Wow, I can't say I've ever seen heat sinks that thin. It's basically just sheet metal that's been bent into the shape of heat sinks. That one's a little how you do in there. And yeah, we've got some caps, we've got some inductors, a few ferrite transformers. Looks like they've opted for the uh, discrete diode route or the through hole diode route rather than the uh, alternative heat sink mounted diodes. 
We got a couple of MOSFETs there. Only on one side though. 470 microfarad, 200 volts, Chang. I've seen Chang X before, but I've never seen just Chang. Got some class Ys there for interference suppression. And that one's kind of bent over. That's, I don't know if you can see that, but that's a little funny looking there. So there, that's our bridge rectifier. This is for the, rectifying the mains. It is fused. It's certainly not an HRC fuse, though. That's regular little glass fuse. Um, I might take this board off and just have a little closer look at it. It's pretty interesting. That's going to be the watchdog chip there. So that chip right there is going to be the one that's going to uh, probably get some modification in the future. I'd like to have a switch to bypass the watchdog so I can subject this thing to a little bit higher surge current without worrying about it tripping its uh, overload. Other than that, it looks like a fairly standard switch mode power supply. Honestly, like, the only thing I'm really disappointed in currently is the width of the aluminum on the heatsink. And that doesn't even necessarily mean it's a bad heatsink because it's really all about surface area when it comes to sinking off heat. The thickness of the aluminum really just assists with having more thermal mass. This is still pretty hot even after sitting for five minutes though without running, so... That one's not, that one's fine, so I don't know. It's something that uh, definitely will be maybe upgradable in the future. Take these screws out, put a beefier heatsink in. I think one big thing might be putting a better fan in. This is just one of those like slim, low profile fans and I think that could easily be replaced with a high velocity fan. So I'll get this thing apart, I'll take this off and then short those caps out to make sure I'm not gonna be in for any surprises and then we'll look at the bottom of the board. Here's a look at the bottom side of the board. They've basically just secured the fan, it looks like across the 12 volt rail. So let's uh, peel back some of this and just give these caps a little discharge just to make sure there's not going to be any zapping going on. Those look good. And yeah, it's, it's a pretty standard SMPS board. That's our watchdog chip, that's what we'll be looking into modding in the future. We've got our output stage stuff, we've got, this looks like the uh, transformer, sides of the other side of the transformer, which it is. And then there's where our MOSFETs go through. Quite a bit of flux on there. It looks like the MOSFETs must have been hand soldered and installed by hand, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Interesting choice to direct solder the fan wires to the board. There is actually a header for that. There's a, there's a fan header over here, but they chose not to use it. I guess uh, maybe the fan had a different connector, the fans they had at the factory, and they decided they'd prefer to use the connectors. Oh, that's interesting. That heat sink is a little on the loose side. I wonder, are these MOSFETs properly soldered, or are they just kind of poked through the board? Yeah, they are soldered through. I think it's just there's a lot of flex in the MOSFET leads. The board itself is not, or the heatsink itself is not really that well soldered. Yeah, that one's better. That one doesn't have that issue. Yeah. I don't know if I like that. More things to upgrade in the future. But uh, yeah, you know, the other, the other, only other weird thing I've noticed, a lot of this stuff's kind of corroded. I almost, it looks like this thing might have been out in the rain for a while. I mean, if you look close at this fuse and these, these diodes, it's all kind of a little bit rough and crusty. That's possible that that was during the flux wash. They always run these boards through like a wash bath to get the flux off after they've been soldered. So that could be what that is. But uh, yeah, I mean, some of this, like, if we have a look at this little uh, polypropylene cap here, the top of it's kind of dusty as well. So it's certainly, this board has gone through an interesting process. But, uh, you know, from what I've seen, there's nothing overtly wrong with this system that I've seen so far. I mean, everything in it looks pretty bog standard. It's The only thing I'm not a fan of is just how flimsy these heat sinks are, but even that, provided that you have a good airflow from the fan, I think is, is probably going to be adequate for most applications. So, you know, for, for the entry-level PC, I would say this is honestly not a bad choice. I didn't test the primary to secondary isolation 
I may put this back together and hook the high pot test up to it just to see if that's got any issues. But, you know, these, these transformers are generally pretty good about being well isolated. And I don't see any, like, major uh, red flags in terms of components getting too close. I mean, the isolation is not great. In a professional power supply, you would probably see, like, an actual, like, long slot going along there. But, I mean, they give it, uh, they give it a slot where things get close together. And where they don't give it a slot, it's at least like three three quarters or uh, three eighths of an inch wide. So that's probably plenty, to, to to be honest. So yeah, you know, maybe further testing is in is in order, and maybe a little modification might be in order. But you know, I uh, don't have much of a problem with this power supply. I think it could be good for a non-critical computer system. Something entry level, nothing with a dedicated GPU probably. Well, you might get away with it. I don't know if I would try it with a dedicated GPU, but you know, anything up to like a mid-range uh, PC or maybe even a light duty gaming rig could probably run pretty comfortably on this. So you'll probably see this in uh, future videos. You'll probably see me take this apart, maybe modify the watchdog circuit, maybe change the heat sinks out, and ultimately maybe build a UPS slash uh, lead acid battery charger or uh, just general purpose benchtop power supply out of this. I don't know if there's a good way to adjust the output voltage. I might be able to do something on that chip uh, and maybe something on the primary side control chip, but my guess is it's probably going to be a fixed 3v3, 5, and 12 power supply. But uh, other than that, you know, I give this, for the price, a, a, certainly a good grade and as a power supply in general, maybe a B minus for the grade. So definitely something that uh, I would consider using on an economical system. I think there is a concern about potentially uh, it being a fire hazard uh, if it were to fail catastrophically. I would like to change that out for an HRC fuse, like a, an actual properly rated uh, high voltage fuse. Uh, but other than that, you know, it's it's probably not going to give you much trouble. I would have to guess it's. I'd have to test it further, of course. But I'll have a link in the description to where I bought this. I'm not sponsored by the manufacturer of this power supply by any means, but uh, if you want to get one to tinker around with or uh, use in your system at your own risk, of course, I will leave the link there. So I looked up some of these part numbers, and actually, this is really interesting. These are not MOSFETs. These are diode packs. And additionally, these are not MOSFETs either. These are BJTs. So what they're actually doing is they're switching the main input supply to these transformers using BJTs, and then they're not actually doing a buck conversion like I thought they would be using these uh, toroidal inductors. They're actually directly rectifying the outputs from these, uh, these transformers without any further uh, active processing. That means this is actually a primary side regulated power supply meaning that basically they just shove power into this uh, into this transformer and they make sure that at least one of the rails tracks along and they basically rely on the winding ratios within the transformer to guarantee or a reasonable level of regulation. This is actually uh, makes a lot of sense and it, it would explain why when the 12 volt rail was heavily loaded the 5 volt rail was actually going up to like 5.4 volts it's uh, just a matter of the non-idealities and the internal resistance of the transformer causing the rails to deviate when under load. So that's actually, this is a really, really old-fashioned kind of power supply. This is like, they, they've brought the costs down by putting as little active circuitry as possible into it and really designing it in such a way that it's going to operate using just the smallest number of active components and the most mostly passive implementation. So pretty fascinating stuff actually. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad power supply. It's just kind of a, an old fashioned way of doing things that's actually pretty fascinating to me that, that they can get a good enough line regulation at the output to actually reasonably power computers with it despite only having one set of active switching uh, circuitry. All right, before I finish this video, I'm going to do a primary to secondary isolation test just to see if there's any significant concern about uh, primary to secondary faults that could lead to shock hazards. So I've got one end of the input connected to the primary connection here. And that's, uh, it, you can probably test against either one of the primary connections because they are going to be fairly low impedance path connected. 
And then the secondary uh, side is just connected to the ground lead. So I've got it at a thousand volt test, and this is also a megometer, so it's gonna tell me if there's any leakage from primary to secondary. So we'll run a test. And it's gone well above a gig ohm, so we have nothing to be concerned about there. I'll switch that off. And just for good measure, we will test against the live side as well, just to see if there's any difference. And that goes up, totally good. So this thing passes a primary to secondary high pot test. That means it uh, is unlikely, although not impossible, to develop a primary to secondary uh, fault. Certainly uh, not at the 240 volts that it's going to be operating at, unless there's some other fault within the case. Now one thing that I saw just before I did this test was, for a second I thought there was no ground wire at all connected to this third pin, this ground. And I thought, well that's a pretty serious safety violation. It means this case could be become live. But I did look closer, and if you look under the bottom, you can see there is actually a shell that is bolted to the case that then ties onto this. It's not my favorite way of doing grounding. It's, uh, it's a little bit cheap and a little bit uh, non-ideal, but technically this case is tied to the third pin and to the ground, so it's not something that I'd be overly concerned about. So other than that, yeah, pretty decent little power supply. The link is again in the description if you want to buy one of these to tinker around with. For 20 bucks, honestly, I think it's worth it just for all the parts. You've got some good high voltage caps. You've got some uh, ferrite core transformers, some MOSFETs and diode packs, and a nice little metal chassis, although somewhat flimsy metal chassis. So uh, yeah, thanks for watching Dielectric videos, and I will see you in the next video.